Welcome to the Roguehead Huddle presented by RGR Football with Gooch and Keys with our special guest today, Jeff, back again. That's your boy, Gooch. That is Keys. That is Jeff. We're back at it again. Make sure you check out the uh, RGR store and all the previous content by Ryan and Dan and Seth and Jeff and Big Chief Sean and I'm sure there's some other people I forgot. My apologies. Um, <clears throat> become a member. Join the three of us plus Ryan and everybody else in the Discord. The mob father. We're all in there. Uh, Keys and Jeff more so than me. But I try to get in there from time to time and uh, let's have some fun. It's good to be yeah, here, guys. Yeah. yeah, Jeff, you uh, you got to go to uh, the Chiefs Broncos game, was it? A couple weeks ago. Right. Yeah, the Broncos Sunday night game. I was there. It was a very enjoyable game. The wind was whipping around. It felt a lot colder than fifty three degrees at, at the kickoff time. <laughs> that wind was blowing right in our face, and man, I tell you what, it was cold. The thing about that, though, is because of the way the stadium is set up, it's not, it feels like it's blowing in your face, but it's really just kind of swirling around the stadium. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's like an ice box in there when you're getting in there. For a Butker to be able to make that 56 yarder and, and banging it off the, the left uh, upright, man, that was something. <laughs> that was amazing. Certain instances like that that make you realize, okay, so. That's why he's paid millions of dollars. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. Well, speaking of destroying teams, let's just get into this last game. Your thoughts on uh, destroying the Raiders again. Jeff, you want to start us off? Sure. I had a uh, friend on Facebook. He posted, hey, can somebody tell me what time the Raiders play today? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty good, but uh, you know, as the game went on after that quick seven to nothing start, every time the ball needed to bounce the Chiefs' way, it did, and it was wonderful to be on that side. Finally, it seemed like for the first time this season, almost. But uh, of course, the Chiefs' defense did an amazing job creating turnovers. Uh, there was one Las Vegas fumble where 87 for the Raiders had the ball in his belly and it bounced away and the Chiefs recovered it. Uh, CEH fumbled the ball. I think it was inside the Raiders 10, bounced off his knee, his momentum took him perfectly to the ball. No big deal. <laughs> you know, it, it was bouncing our way. But, you know, we've heard it from the media, the unfortunate passing of, uh, of Snead's brother. And then add to that the Raiders having the goofball meeting on the, you know, the, the arrow at the 50. I, I think those, you know, whether the some of the players knew about that meeting or not, I, I feel like those two emotional reasons caused the Chiefs to be super focused. <laughs> and, you know, at that level, any edge you can get is, is going to help. And, and we just, we saw it. I mean, that was it. It was, you know, the Chiefs were, nine of 13 on third down and, and the Raiders were four, 11, four of 11. And, uh, you know, we were plus five in the turnovers, you know, Las Vegas offense can't score more than 15 points in four of their last five games. It, it just, it just was never, never a game. What, what did you guys take away from, uh, from the beat down? Yeah. And, and to your point, Jeff, I think it was, uh, no, I don't think it was, it was, the Honey Badger um, was interviewed, I believe, after the game. And from what he said, I don't think many, many, if any of the players knew about the pregame meeting on the Arrowhead, but they they were focused on, one, playing for Snead, but two, they were still angry about last year when the Raiders were running laps. And, and you know, I think maybe some of us forgot that or didn't they really cared about that we already played the Raiders after that but clearly got in their own heads the Chiefs defense got in their own heads enough to where you know they let this become a a uh, catalyst for them to come out and just kick some butt from from the very beginning so you know I know we were talking Jeff I think it was a heart healthy win 
you know, we can put that little uh, American Heart Association stamp. There it was a heart win because from the very first play from scrimmage, the Chiefs got the lead. And from there, I mean, everything was nice and calm and peaceful and enjoyable for me. The good cholesterol went up and the bad cholesterol right. went down. <laughs> Well, I think you guys said it all, except for the fact that I think it's just finally time that the ball started bouncing the Chiefs' way. Yeah. Um, I think we, um, I think we had a run of good fortune the first couple of years, and this year, those passes that Mahomes usually connects with were becoming interceptions, and <clears throat> for some, Mahomes didn't turn the ball over much. So then the fumbles, you know, all these uncharacteristic things were happening to this team, which is, it's the nature of the NFL. You know what I'm saying? The ball's going to bounce your way, just like teams that go eight and two and one score games eventually come back, you know, to the mean. Yes. Um, I think, um, I think that was nice. I think we could still do the running, use the running game more. I think Clyde only had 37 yards rushing. Now I realize that, you know, the, the the uh, screen game is like a run in Andy Reid's offense, but still, you got those big guys. And just like um, I hate to bring up the Patriots, but just like the Patriots did to the Bills, and you talk to those linemen after, there's nothing like imposing your will and moving a guy from his spot to another spot and letting your running back just kind of eat. Um, <clears throat> but on the flip side of that, it was good to see what was – Mom's a very efficient 24, 28, 20 or 24 or whatever. Yeah. 296, two TDs. The offense moved up and down the field. It was good to see. Uh, I honestly think, if you want me to be completely honest, I don't think EB's calling plays anymore. Because the last two games have been way too smooth. And and, and I, what I say about it, just the offense doesn't seem – disconjointed like Mahomes doesn't seem <clears throat> those first few games it was like even Mahomes was questioning the play call like what is this you know what I'm saying and now he's just kind of just going out there calling the play taking the play that he's getting called and they're moving and pundits are going to say oh it's six game winning streak but they beat Daniel Jones and they beat Jordan Love and they beat the Raiders twice and Yada, yada, yada. It's the NFL. Washington almost beat the Cowboys this week. And the Cowboys had a huge lead. And Washington came back. So it's not, you can't poo-poo on what's been happening. Um, just like uh, like for those that are, are crapping on, on the Chiefs and oh, it's against these teams. The Patriots play the Jets, the Dolphins, and the Bills. And they're going to win that division with a rookie quarterback. And I, I don't I, – the AFC West is tougher than the AFC East. We don't have our Jets to beat up on. I mean, I guess that would be the Raiders. Um, but the Raiders are tougher than the Jets. The Raiders are 6-5 and five when not playing the Chiefs. So you take out the two losses to the Chiefs, the Raiders are in the wild card hunt. So I, they're, they're, not, they're not a pushover. They're not walkovers. And Carr was an MVP candidate until he broke his ankle. It's not his fault he's had three more offensive coordinators and John Gruden and Mark Davis and all that. Um, so all in all, like you guys said, good heart, healthy win. Um, I think the Sneed thing played a hand in them being uh, motivated because they're like family. Uh, Mahomes chartered him a private jet so he could get down there faster. And, and although – a lot of the players hadn't heard Mahomes heard about them being on the 50. So even though Tyron may not have heard or tried to blow it off or whatever, you, you don't go into somebody, like Mahomes said, you don't go into somebody's house or something that they built and then basically try to disrespect them. And I know Mahomes said something to the offense like, they ain't here standing on the logo. Like, on the logo. <laughs> That's why I'm I'm with you guys. Great win. I'm waiting on the stomping of the Chargers this week. 
<laughs> um, because then, and, I'll, and it's not even for me per se, because I really think we can win. It's because then everybody's going to be like, well, they beat the Chargers, so I guess we got to shut up now. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, that's really what I want because I get tired of hearing, oh, the Chiefs haven't beat anybody outside of the Raiders. Their offense is struggling, yada, 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 yada. Uh, I don't care if we win 7-0. to zero. Wins win. And if the defense is holding opponents to nine points a game, the offense only needs to score 14. Win. <laughs> Dang right. You know, Gooch, I was just go ahead. okay. I was looking at the uh, the number of running plays versus pass plays that we had in the Raiders game, and even if you take away the three kneel downs and then Gore's long run, we still twenty six runs, twenty four pass plays. So it was surprising to me that we actually had more running plays than passing plays for the game. Yeah, maybe Andy's turning over a new leaf. I, geez. <laughs> it was 21 well, I mean, nothing, you know. What, you, know? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, true that. But also, too, I, I honestly think that people aren't seeing, um, aren't seeing what we're capable of because Andy's holding back. Um, 17 game season. I think Andy's preparing to not have the one seed. And so, you know, you're going to get at least one game in Arrowhead, but you're going to have to hit the road for the rest. And that's when you're going to start seeing, like, Andy just let those big boys run. Um, Josh Gordon is going to all of a sudden show up when everybody's going to be like, where has he been? Um, Because I noticed in the game that Patrick was chucking the ball his way more, um, even trying to find him. And that one pass that I don't know if they called it a drop, it was actually tipped when he was trying to hit uh, Josh on that out route. Um, but they're, I think it's going to be interesting. I think you're going to see some really cool stuff, and Andy's just kind of holding everything close to the vest. This could be – I don't know what it is. I said something to Keys. I just feel like this might be Andy's last run. Like, it, something about the season has that feel to me. Like – because he really didn't change anything when they were, you know, was it two and four or whatever it was? He didn't change anything. And maybe that's just because that's how he is and eventually work it back, work it out. But I just I just get the feeling like if he, if he runs the table, he's done. But I'm going to enjoy it anyway. Good win, Keith. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um... You know, I gave the the nice answer before I come give a more detailed answer now. You know, on the one hand, we did get the lucky bounces in this game. CEH did get his fumble back, but he still fumbled. And so, you know, again, he's going to have to work on that because you can't, you can't count on getting the bounce. You can't, you just can't count on getting the bounce your way. Um, you know, but on a positive side, you know, when Tyreek had that, the, the catch on the, on the great, um, Mahomes play, you know, where he was running five or six miles an hour to his left or whatever, and threw it across his body for 53.5 yards, whatever it was. Right. I believe that was the play. One of the things that stood out to me and Gooch, I know this is something that you've harped on Tyreek for, but I believe it was the play where he did his patented, you know, jump up and catch it in his hip. Now, I know you don't like that, but I think maybe we're coming around to that, right? Because we would rather have Tyreek jumping up when he doesn't need to than him fully extended where he can tip the ball up in the air. And so for me, that's something that stood out to me and that I, you know, for me is a positive because I think you have a, a harder time tipping somebody else when you're jumping up two feet and letting it hit you in the gut, as opposed to risking, because Pat had been throwing passes that were rising, you know, like when you ever watch baseball, there are some guys that just have rising fastballs that just keep going up. Right. And for whatever reason, Patrick had been throwing those. And 
in this game, at least that stood out to me about Tyreek. Um, you know, another negative was Travis still was not able to get open. And now if you watch presser today, we're filming on Tuesday, Andy's presser today, you know, he talked about, you know, the holding and the different things that, that um, the opposition was doing. And one of the reporters going off the voice, I think it might have been Nate Taylor, but someone asked him, um, you know, if Andy had been talking to the league about this, you know, about the things that he'd told them. And he said something to the effect of, um, I want to buy my grandchildren Christmas presents this year, so I can't comment on, on this one. Yeah, I didn't want to get fined. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to get fined. He didn't say that, but yeah, he said said uh, I want to buy my want to buy my grandkids Christmas presents this year, so I can't answer this one. And I thought that was kind of funny. Yes. But yeah, I mean, they're going to have to continue to figure out ways to get Travis um ball. Of course, I mean, the truth is referees start calling the penalties that they should be calling. And we saw this in the last game, as Andy said, I think one of his comments was, you know, once they once they get called for it three times, like they like the Raiders did, you know, once they get called for the defensive holding three times, you know, that'll help out. Well, I mean, we need to make sure that you know that we're doing things or el or else making sure that the refs are calling it, because if they do, I mean it's almost like the NFL, for whatever reason, has decided that the Chiefs are going to play on all Madden. You know, so they're calling games differently for the Chiefs than they are other teams. They're letting teams get away with with abusing Travis, holding him. And it's not even five yards. The rule is five yards. I saw plenty of plays over the last four or five, six weeks where it's 10 yards downfield and they're still holding him and they're not calling anything. And it's like you can't have two sets of rules, right? You know, because if, if our defenders barely touch a guy lately, they've been fairly quick to throw a flag on our defenders, whereas Travis is basically getting tackled or having someone, like, hold on to him and let him drag drag him, you know, past the five yards, sometimes down, you know, 10 yards downfield. I mean, I'm speaking in hyperbole, but, you know, the reality is that the refs are letting other defenses get away from just because – if they don't, we saw in the er, early in the season when they don't, then defenses cannot stop Travis. The only thing that can stop Travis is Travis dropping the ball. And so, you know, it really seems like the refs have to unfairly give the other team a chance, which is why I say it's like we're playing an all Madden. Um, and I know this particularly because in our RGR uh, fantasy football league i have travis and it's been killing me three out of the last four or five weeks because oh now we're getting rest. to it all right now we're seeing it. all right <laughs> well, i'm just saying i you know i i look at it more because of that and so, yeah and so um you also but also too you can't you can't blame all the defenders all the time like travis has played a season's worth of games more than every other player in the NFL. Everybody on this Chiefs team that was here the last few years has played a season more of games. So, and Travis is getting older. And on top of that, look, if I can get away with it and I know that Tyreek and Kelsey are your only true trusted weapons, well, yeah, I'm going to beat him up. And I'm going to get away with holding him as much as I can. Because if you can't throw them to, you don't trust those other bums. So you're not going to beat me, Um, which I think is another reason why Josh was getting thrown the ball. Um, Of course, Pringle. uh, We all start calling Pringle 7-Eleven. That kid's always open. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he just is. And and they're trying to force Gordon the ball because once you get into the playoffs, you might see teams try to double, try to bracket Kelsey and Hill and make those guys beat you. And so now you're gonna have to force you're gonna have to force these guys to you know carry you sometimes. Um, another reason why I think Patrick is starting to actually throw the ball to Clyde in the flat. Um, I don't think he likes it because Clyde is like four foot eleven, 
and Patrick isn't used to throwing the ball down towards the ground for somebody to catch it. But, I mean, it just – I agree. But I just – like, we have to also add in other factors too. Like, I mean, Kelsey's 31 playing in his year 33 season with all the games that they play. And uh, he's probably tired. Bring out Gray. Where hey, the hell is you... Fortson? I know where Fortson is. Don't you get me started. <laughs> if if you would have told me before this game that Tyreek Hill's going to catch four passes, Kelsey's going to catch three, and we're going to win by 39, <laughs> I would have said, mm-hmm. yeah, what, what are you smoking? And you need to share that with me. But, yeah, it's <laughs> right. uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I, think, I think there are a lot of positives for this game. You know, again, I still want to see it against a team that's not theirs because, you know, when it's the same team, you know, Two your your two best offensive games have been against the same team in the same year. You know it kind of makes you a little iffy. Um, but yeah, I mean there's still there are still a lot of positives and things that really aren't opponent dependent on there. And so, you know, I think the Cowboys game and and some of the other games, the opposing defenses were making sure that they covered the running back uh, better. Um, and so they were basically taking away Travis, Tyreek, and the running back. You know, in this game, I don't know. I haven't watched. I haven't watched any of the film. I haven't went back and watched any of the film yet. But my guess is what I remember is the Raiders. You know, were leaving the running back open more. Um, you know, I think we're at the point, like you said, though, moving forward. I think we're at the point where, if you're Andy and Pat. You, you got to stop using everybody that's not Tyreek and Travis as decoys. Like, you got to start using Travis and Tyreek as the ones who are decoys. And um, Dan did a breakdown the other day, and he showed, you know, a play, uh, I think, from last week's game where um, they had CEH running a wheel route on the left, and Travis was doing a crosser, and I forget all the different plays on here, but Pat had motioned CEH to the left side to have him run this route. And, you know, I'm thinking as I'm watching this play develop, I'm like, I would keep CEH on the right side because basically what ended up happening was CEH was running the wheel route. Two of the defenders uh, covered him. I think it was like a linebacker and a safety and maybe it was Tyreek that was running the crosser, and that's who who Pat threw it to. And we got this down, but if you go back and you, you watch Dan's breakdown or you go back and watch the film, if you leave CEH on the right side, let him run that wheel route to the right, and you use Travis and Tyreek as the decoys, you know, one of two things is going to happen. One, CEH is completely open, and he doesn't have anyone covering him, and he's getting a touchdown on the pass. Or if the safety jumps over to grab CEH, then you're leaving Travis or Tyreek one-on-one, and one of them's getting an easy touchdown pass. But I think the difference is is we're so stuck on using everybody else's decoys and having Travis or Tyreek as the first and a lot of times second options, whereas we're at the point now where, you know, just as we have to prove that we're willing to run the ball, I think we have to prove that we're willing to use Travis and Tyreek as the decoys to free up Pringle, to free up Hardman, to, you know, free up Bell or Gray, whoever they're going to use as the second tight end, um, instead of the other way around. And I think once we do that, at least put it on film and put it on film consistently enough, it's really going to open up the offense even more. And, you know, when you get to that point, when you show that you're capable of doing it all and that you're willing to do it all, you know, I think that's where the magic starts to really happen. I'd just like to point out before we move on that I'm starting a petition for Armani Watts to get that touchdown because that was Rob Fronin. That that was a TD. I'm just saying. (laughs) I've been waiting all year to get some Watts love because Sorensen has been in there when he shouldn't have been, and then he finally gets it, and they call it dead. 
any other yeah. time they'd let that defensive player run that back and then they'd go look at it. But yeah, McCollum did. Sorry, Amani, yeah. I got you, brother. You've been one of my favorite players since you were drafted. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll I'll give you that, and and I felt bad for him too. And that was that play was kind of one of those dumb plays because usually it doesn't happen like that. Usually, a ref crew will let that play, you know, just whatever happens, and then let the replay process do things, you know, the right way and make the correct call instead of blowing a play dead wrongly and, and completely robbing a player of that and you know these are kind of the you don't want to just say the refs are out to get a team but these are the kind of plays that you know as you add them up over the course of a game or over the course of a season that you know can can lead to fans kind of you know thinking yeah maybe that's the case um i mean at the end of the day it might be petty because we were we were winning and we were gonna win you know and we got a big win but you still like to see petty (laughs) <laughs> very true you still like to see him get get it though um and the rest yeah. can't find me you guys were terrible <laughs> i i don't know I, I don't think there's really much that we can take apart the defense for in this game you know with sneed gone you know, I thought there would be more issues than what we had. Like things seem to go really smoothly, and Hughes, Hughes in there playing. I mean, he punched the ball out twice. He was so all over the field that I thought he actually punched out, you know, the ball three times. Um, but I guess it was only twice. And so, either way, that's something that I've been wanting to see from defensive players for like two years now. Uh, ever, ever since we played the Lions, and uh, you know, you had Patricia coaching the Lions to punch the ball out of our our playmakers' hands. And you just – we haven't seen that really from Chiefs players. You know, we haven't had even either the willingness or the technical soundness to be proficient at punching the ball out while we've seen – we've been the victim of that from time to time. So I thought, you know, that was a another positive. Um, you know, we, you already mentioned Gore's run, which we need, we have to have explosive run plays if we're not getting explosive pass plays. And so, I don't know. I think overall, just a a very, very happy win. Yes, indeed. Very enjoyable. Couldn't agree more. I was, I don't know, it was like halfway through the third quarter. I was ready to move on. Move on to the Chargers. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yep. Gooch, anything else you want to add? Uh, the Chiefs had already moved on to the Chargers. Apparently, Spags had his whole defensive unit, his defensive coaches, do drop a game plan for the Chargers, and they had it on his desk Friday. Nice. Before the Raiders game and after the game. Um, I'm being told that um, after everybody went home, uh, Andy and EB went back to the office and started working on offense for the Chargers game. Sure. So they didn't go home, um, which I thought was kind of neat. That the because Ryan talked about it was like um, you know those guys don't take a day off, and apparently Spags expects so much. So he was like, they had a report for me on my desk Friday morning before the game. Yep. And then Andy just coached three hours, four hours, worked the football and was like, all right, so we're not going home. And I'm sure he got him a cheeseburger waiting in the office and they just went back to work. Um, all right, I'm done. Jeff hasn't talked enough, so let's move on to the next topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, this is kind of a, let's, we can segue into this because, you know, as Jeff said, kind of ready to move on in the middle of the third quarter. <laughs> and I thought that we, that we should have moved on from our starters that early, especially, you know, when you're playing a chippy team like the Raiders where, you know, everybody hates each other um, and, and you know that they're going to be out to try to injure our guys. But on the other side, you know, I think in a blowout win and Gucci are used to this as a Bama fan. I think it's in these kind of situations that you want to start getting your second and third stringers in when you have a nice lead 
so they can start to get some of that actual game, you know, the game situations. You don't want to have to force them in, even though I know that they, they all say next man up, but you don't want to have to force them in um, because there's an injury or, you know, because, you know, a player has to miss because of COVID protocol or, you know, personal reasons. And so, you know, with that said, I think we missed getting to see some players earlier than maybe we wanted to, which kind of segues into our next question here. And that's, you know, what players do you want to see on the field more moving forward the rest of this season? Yeah, I, I don't really have a long list as the season has gone on. The starting lineup has changed a lot. The The number of snaps ha has changed somewhat. As you look down through the depth charts, you know, players have moved up. And uh, really, as I looked at our depth charts, the only guy I can come up with is, is somebody that I want to see get more involved in the offense, and, and that's Josh Gordon. As soon as he comes off the, the COVID list, you know, let's, let's get him some looks. He's had a lot of snaps. It's not like he's not on the field, but, uh, you know, let's, let's get – the ball in his hands somehow. <laughs> yeah, Gooch. I'm gonna I'm gonna two part this with going back to your <clears throat> pulling the starters. Now I know they put more second string in on the defensive side, but I think Andy kept the starting offense in to get them more reps, more time because. Andy said, even after the win, there's still a lot that they need to work on. So I think he left them. And I think when you're when you're winning like that, and it's it's going to sound bad. I never want to say an NFL game was easy, but with as easy as it was looking, I think Andy could see stuff that we couldn't see. And so he's like, we still got to get these bugs worked out. There's only four games left in the season, and then there's playoffs, you know, and. You don't fix it by playoff time, you're going to get surprised and sent home early. Um, now, as far as players being on the field more, um, I think Bolton has earned starter reps from Hitchens. I think he's yep. earned it. Um, and I realize that there is an affinity. I won't even say affinity. By Andy Rule's standards, the veterans can't lose their spot based on injury. And that, you know, but at this point, Bolton has had to have earned it, I would think, um, to be calling plays and be out there. The guy has a nose for the football. Same with Gay. He has the speed. I'd like to see him coming off the field less on third down. Um, I'd like to see more Watts as opposed to Sorensen. Because even with – even you take out the fumble – What's the biggest thing about Dan Sorensen? Oh, he knows the defense and he's where he's supposed to be. So does Watts, and Watts is faster um, and a lot more athletic. Um, other than that, I like to see Gore get a little run. Um, I know Ryan said that they'll probably bring Daryl back because it'll be cheap, but Gore will be cheaper than Daryl and they have the same skill set. Um, although I don't think I've seen Gore catch, but I assume – you know, with the way the NFL and the colleges are running, that he can catch the ball out of the backfield, I would assume. Um, also big enough to pick up the blocks. And Flash. Who doesn't want to see more Flash? You know what I'm saying? Let's, let's give Flash some more TDs. You know, that he can run that slant that Kelsey can run, you know. Um, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to side with Ryan here a little bit too. Let's get Burton on the wheel route, huh? Let's let that big guy run. <laughs> I mean, we used to let Sherman run at least once a game. Let's get Burton, you know, a couple of touches and, and see what he does with it. Came from catching passes from Drew Brees to Mahomes. Let him get out in some space. And let him rumble, bumble, stumble on down the field. Burton only had That's five right. snaps, Gooch. Man. Yeah. Crazy. I need to get him out there more. Keys. 
Yeah, so, you know, I, I think it would have been nice to see gray, to see some more gray. Um, you know, you mentioned Burton, you know, on the offense. You know, I th I'm fine with the offensive line. You know, generally, generally, you don't see a lot of times where offensive lines, you know, are just like, just taken out, you know, like you're doing a shift change in, in hockey or whatever, you know, a line change in hockey, whatever it's called. Um, you don't really, you know, normally see that. And, and of course, as long as Pat, Pat is back uh, at, at QB, you're not going to take out your offensive line. Um, I did notice, you know, they except, did. Except for Wiley. Please get Wiley out of there. I mean, that guy was using, that guy was using his one arm to push Wiley back into Patrick. And I'm like, Come on, like <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, Keith. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, there there was a point where they did put what I think Allegretti in at left guard and Niang in at right tackle. Um, but but to go back to your point, have you guys seen the clip where um, I think it was Max Crosby? I think it was Max Crosby who was going up against Wiley. I think this was a play, and he started to spin against Wiley and Trey Smith was right there ready to just crush him right off of his spin and just destroy him, which was so fun to watch. And so, you know, I think that's what you want to see when you, when you have a defensive player salivating against going against Wiley, you know, to just do that spin move and then halfway through a spin as he's getting around, there's Trey to just destroy him. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you there. Um, you know, I, I still think that, and of course, you know, you don't know how these games are going to go when you're, you're selecting your inactives. But, you know, in high, hindsight, this would have been a good game to have Shane Bouchel active uh, for the game and to have uh, Prince Winnebago, as you call him, Gooch, uh, <laughs> active. You know, so they can get some some actual game reps. Um, you know, defensively, I knew you were going to say Watts, and, and I don't disagree with you there. And I would throw out DoD. You know, as we've said, I think multiple times. Um, you know, I can understand. I can understand limiting Willie and Nick snaps simply because Willie's coming off of you know an injury. Uh, being injured last year and Bolton, you know, is transitioning to a longer season, you know, being a rookie. So I can understand some, you know, some, uh, some management of how, of their snaps, but what I don't care for is that you're still keeping Neiman and Sorensen out there so long when you could be, putting Watts out there easily. You could be putting DOD out there. Um, and if you're not putting these guys out there, you're telling me that the only reason they're on this team is because Tobe wanted them on his special teams units, which I find disturbing because if your fourth safety isn't a guy that you trust to put in in a blowout and your what fourth linebacker isn't a guy that you trust that you're going to have to put in it, it, you know, if you have one or two injuries and you don't trust them to put them in during a blowout, I mean, you need to go out and find a different fourth safety and a different fourth linebacker. And I don't care how great they are in special teams. If you can't trust them in a blowout to be seeing the field, uh, you know, what better way on the positive side, you know, I did see Bolton rush the passer once, at least once. I saw him rushing the passer and, you know, stuck in my mind because of it. I wasn't expecting it. And I also saw him drop into coverage at least once, too, you know, for the same reason. So, you know, those were positives without going back and rewatching the whole game. But at least at least twice, at least once he, he blitz and, and at least once uh, he dropped into coverage. So, uh, you know, I was happy about those things. But. You know, for me, again, I always want to see, I want to see more Watts, as you said, uh, take some of those Sorens and snaps away. Because it's one thing if we see Sorensen blitzing, 
Sorensen and Neiman blitzing, or as I call, you know, wasting blockers, preoccupying blockers. But we've been seeing them dropping into deep single high. We've been seeing them drop into deep cover two. And I'd rather see what Watts can do there, especially because Watts is, what, seven, six, seven, eight years younger than Sorensen. And at some point, you got to give the kid a chance to, to prove what he can do so you know whether you want to pay him or not. And he did show up in preseason, and I thought he showed up his time on the field uh, Sunday. So, you know, I want to see more Watts. I want to see more Gore. Um, you know, I don't know how much growth Gore has. You know, I'm going to disagree with you here. I understand Daryl is in because he's – He's a good pass catcher, and he's a good pass blocker. Um, Gore is older than Daryl, and I think that's something we kind of miss. You know, he's been around the NFL for a little bit. You can look at me all you want, Gucci. He just turned 27. His birthday was yesterday, Monday. So happy birthday to Derek Gore. You had a, a great birthday present there. Um, Daryl. Wait, was Daryl in that 30? Daryl is 26. He turns 27 in April. Yeah, Williams so, is 26. Gore is 27. Yeah. So, you know, I and I think I've never heard of Gore before he joined the team. He yeah. played for the Chargers for a year or two. I think he was on their practice squad a little bit. Um, other than that, I don't know if he bounced around at all or not. But if he did, he was basically a practice squad player. So that would be why. So, did you guys you know him no relation to Frank? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I think I looked it up during the preseason. Um, you know, and so I understand Derek Gore is not going to be, like, the featured back. He's not going to be, probably not even be the second back. Because at this point, you know, if he can't pass block well enough that he's getting those opportunities over Daryl, he's probably not going to ever be good enough to do that. And if he's, I would think if he's good enough, well, I don't want to say that because I believe CEH is probably good enough to be getting those pass routes and he still isn't. So I think that's probably more of a coaching thing or a Patrick isn't comfortable throwing it to CEH or, or Gore thing. But regardless, Gore still got the explosive run in the win. And that's something that Daryl and CEH have not shown that they can do. So I still want to see Gore get more carries. Um, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, give Daryl the goal line carries, you know, throw him the ball, but give CEH and Gore the rushes. And however you want to split that, I want to see Gore get more rushes, more touches than he has. But, you know, as long as he sees more touches, I'll be happy. I'd just like to point out before we move on that for those of y'all that question the Chiefs' choices, Darwin Thompson was on this team. He went to the Bucks, and I haven't heard squat since he joined Tampa Bay. Um, so now Tampa Bay seeing something that we saw. I'm just saying for those guys questioning what's going on, of course, we're going to question. This is what we do. But um, in reality, like, I was I, – I loved Darwin for his, his spiciness in college. Like, and I really wanted him to be something, but don't you see him every day? And he went to the Bucks, signed with the Bucks, and I think he's on their practice squad. So – I mean, it's, it is what it is. I'm done. Well, I'll let Jeff have the final word. A after I just mentioned that clearly Darwin has low awareness because he chose to sign with the Bucks over signing to the Chiefs practice squad. And so, you know, I, I think that kind of proves he has low awareness, right? It's kind of like when my wife questions my decision-making and I point out to her, that she chose me, you know, so I think my decision making is clearly more reliable. And so, you know, it's kind of one of those situations where 
the Bucks should have thought to themselves, if Darwin wants to sign with us, clearly this isn't a very intelligent guy. We don't want him on our roster. How in the heck do I follow that up? Yeah, let's uh, move on from the relationship advice. Uh, yeah. And uh, the, um, yeah, I mean, you got to have a stable of running backs in today's NFL. I know the Titans want to give the ball to Derrick Henry 400 times a year, but, you know, you have to be able to run different running backs out there and expect that they're going to pass block and catch the ball out of the backfield as well as get six yards, you know, on first down. So I hopefully, hopefully all the guys are good with that. You know what I mean? They don't feel like they got to be out there for 25 or 30 straight runs. So uh, I, I feel good about where we are Gore and, uh, and Williams and, and our first round draft pick, Mr. Hilaire Edwards Hilaire. Yeah. You know, It's kind of interesting, Jeff. I'm going to go a little Jeff on you here. It's interesting if you look at, and man, I'm sorry, whoever this was that posted these on on Twitter, I saved the photos, but, you know, now I can't give proper uh, citation to to whoever it was that came up with these. But someone, maybe it was an article. uh, It was. It was an article that I read that talked about um, the formula for winning games. You know, and I think they were looking at Bill Belichick's formula. But anyway, they did like the offensive variables and the defensive variables. And they looked at, you know, how these different variables affect your your um, your success in winning a game. And offensively, if you have a 100-yard rusher, you have a 73.43% chance of winning the game. Now that's a hundred yard rusher. That's not a hundred yards rushing in the game. Yeah. If you have, if you have a hundred yards rushing in the game, it's 64.16%. So it's nearly 10% lower to have a hundred yards rushing in the game versus having one player who gets to a hundred yards. Now, you know, I guess for me, logically, that would be because you have a talented running back and that's why they're getting to 100 yards as opposed to, you know, throwing a bunch of different guys out there. But I mean, I don't know. It's kind of one of those weird, weird stats. I mean, you're the top variable, top offensive variable for winning is scoring 30 plus points, as we should know very well as Chiefs fans. You do that and you have nearly an 87 percent chance of winning. You know, and then and then I know Gooch wants to know what's the next one. Well, the next one is scoring 25 plus points. So it's 30 points or more. And then the second best is scoring 25 or more. And that's a 81.1 percent chance. And then from there, it's 75 percent completion rate gives you an 81 percent chance. No turnovers is number four. That gives you a. 76.45% chance of winning. So you have more than three out of four just by not turning the ball over. This is not the analytics episode. (laughs) (laughs) And then it's after that that you have the 100 yards rusher. So it's kind of one of those interesting things. Jeff brought up up the running back, and you brought up the running back thing earlier. You know, we need to run the ball more. Mm Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, there, you know, there's, there's well, see, two because, sides to everything, but. Because you're, you're talking percentages and I'm more or less, I say run the ball more because if I'm a linebacker, the last thing I want to do is tackle Derrick Henry 30 times a game. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just whoa, 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 don't want to do it. Unless you're Nick Bolton. Well, that guy's crazy. But what Maybe. I'm saying is, is I don't want, I don't want. I don't want Anytime to you have the opportunity to, to spank King Henry 30 times and say, I'm your daddy, and King Henry walks back to the huddle and says, who is this kid? Who's 54? Yeah. 30 yeah, times. You, first, you, you take it's it. The first time, it's the first time it's ever been done in the NFL to Henry. But on the reality, like most teams, including Earl. Thomas? The safety. Yeah. 
I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to hit him. After a while, you, after a while, it starts to become a business decision. Is he going to fall down, or am I going to fall down and just let him run? You know, you know what I'm saying? It just that's why I feel like because I feel like with Brown who blocked for Lamar, Tooney who had to block for Statues, Tom Brady. That's that's basically like run game because um, he ain't going nowhere. So you're going to have to hold people off. Creed who blocked for Jalen Hurts and Kyler Murray. Um, the Trey, who blocked at Tennessee, and all they did really well was run the ball. And then Yang from, was it TCU? Yeah, I believe so. They had a really good running back down there, too. And that guy was a beast. So I feel like, you know, you um, let those dogs just kind of shove you around for a while and try to find Clyde Edwards Hilaire or Daryl who likes to lower the crown of his helmet and hit you in the chest. You know what I'm saying? After a while, you just don't want to do that, and then the game becomes a whole lot easier. I mean, if if you don't believe me, ask the Bills defense. (laughs) All right, I'm done. All right. Yeah, I'm I I understand where you're going there. And yeah, it, you know, it it takes the defense out of I'm hitting you mode and they're the ones who are who are taking the damage. I mean, you know, I know I don't know what it's like to tackle Derrick Henry, but when I played football all the way back to 7th grade, you know, cuz we were all small kids in 7th grade and uh we played a team who had this giant. I mean, this kid was like I don't know how he was in seventh grade. He was like six foot both ways. You know, they had, they had like a, a college freshman offensive tackle playing running back on a seventh grade football team. And that was their play. Every play was handed off to the six foot by six foot guy and see, you know, I mean, like it was exactly what you think of, you know, where there were three or four or five of us trying to, tackle this guy at his knees and if he landed on you i mean it just knocked the wind out of you so you know i understand what you're saying there um so well we'll... i'm I'm a pretty big boy and i've tried to tackle a couple of um nfl safeties uh in my backyard and let me tell you there's nothing like being hit by i mean i'm a grown man but those are grown men there's nothing like bouncing off some guy that all he does is lift weights and train every day. The yep. ground seems to feel a lot harder when you hit it. Every Trust play me. is and a car wanna... crash, man. It's just... <laughs> and you don't want to feel that uh, because we'd be in the backyard of Thanksgiving and, oh, let's go have our annual football game. And usually the one guy to get punished the most was me. And after you hit that ground a, f- a few times, it, well, when they hit you, you speed up. So 15, 20 miles an hour, that becomes less and less enjoyable even for a really what's supposed to be a non-competitive game. <laughs> so I can imagine <laughs> in a game where you're getting paid money, it, it becomes even less enjoyable because you're like, well, you know what? Nah. <laughs> oh, shucks. Okay. Yeah, this... <laughs> This this pretty well perfectly t- takes us into our uh, our next question here from Jeff, and that's is roughing the quarterback going too far as far as roughing the passer penalties? Is it going too far in the NFL? Yes. <laughs> next question. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. going to ma- match your one word answer with my own one word answer. Depends. <laughs> well, I mean, if you think right, back Jeff, to break his the, break the tie. <laughs> yeah, you, you think back to as little as 10 or 15 years ago, picture in your mind a given quarterback getting hit. You know, they get smashed and crunched. And, you know, I remember Aaron Rodgers getting his collarbone broken with a with a big hit. That that would get flagged this year, right? You know, you can't hit a quarterback low. Uh, a defender is getting blocked and loses control of his feet, he's diving for the quarterback and ends up hitting him, you know, below the waist, what's the defender supposed to do? <laughs> is he supposed to 
turn his body and miss the quarterback. It's just getting ridiculous. Anytime, you know, anybody gets within four inches of the head, the quarterback turns and whines to the referee. Oh my gosh, he, he came within a football's length of my head. Aren't you going to throw a flag? It just, I don't know. It, it seems to me in five to 10 years, we're going to put a waist on the quarterback with the little Velcro flags. And when you pull the flag, the quarterback's down. And then we have to go to instant replay to see if the, he let go of the ball before the flag got pulled. You know what I mean? I, I understand that we're trying to make it safe and there's 17 game seasons and the guys are getting bigger and stronger. And, and I get all that, but man, I, I think the roughing, you know, what, whatever, you know, they say uh, the rules are supposed to be, you know, encouraged. They're, they're focusing, uh, they're enhancing, they're, they're really taking a look at what is a roughing the passer call. And I, I think the pendulum has swung too far to, you know, it, it's getting to where how are, how are you supposed to tackle the quarterback? You got like an eight inch wide area that you can hit him. And if you get too high or too low, it's going to cost your team 15 yards. Yeah. So I'm going to make a prediction here and I'm going to explain my answer. Tom Brady is what? 44. He's supposedly playing till he's 50. So I'm actually going to make a prediction that, in six years, we see the rules soften a lot more, not get tougher a lot more. Once upon a time, the Kansas City Chiefs drafted a safety out of, I believe, Purdue by the name of Bernard Bonecrusher Pollard. Yeah. And Bone he, crusher. he ended Tom Brady's season, and I don't want to go too far into this because that led to Matt Castle going 10-5 and five with the Patriots proving that Tom Brady was never the reason the Patriots won and ended up with the Chiefs because of his success with the Patriots. So we, we, we don't want to talk about that too much. But Tom Brady got injured. And ever since that day, every roughing the quarterback or roughing the passer penalty might as well be called the Brady rule. I know there's plenty of Brady rules already. But the reality is that you can't even look at Tom Brady without getting a flag. Now, <laughs> I said depends because on the opposite side of the spectrum is actually Patrick Mahomes. And all those things you mentioned, players can do all that to Patrick and a lot more, and they're not getting called for it. And it's absolutely ridiculous. Like, when Patrick actually draws a roughing the passer penalty or a personal foul from another team, like it is like so extreme and it so rarely happens that it's really ridiculous. Like, so that's why I say depends. And I don't know how many other quarterbacks are out there like that, but Patrick does not have penalties called against him with the same standard that Brady or other quarterbacks have when they're playing football. So that's why I say depends because until I see Patrick start getting all those different calls, then, you know, I can't say yes fully. And I still believe again, in six years, once Brady's out of the league, the refs are going to be harder on quarterbacks again. And you'll see those numbers go down simply because, I mean, let's face it, Brady, don't get me started on this one. I, I don't want to get started on this rant. The guy is not a treasure. I don't care what any moron says. He's not a treasure. He gets away with all kinds of stuff. And this is one of the areas where he just gets away with too much, where you can't even look at the guy without drawing a personal foul flag while Patrick is on the exact opposite spectrum like I, it it's almost to the point where if a defender brought a switchblade out there and stabbed him, he wouldn't draw a foul, and it's ridiculous. What was that movie, The Last Boy Scout, when the guy pulled out a gun and shot a defender as he was running to the end zone? <laughs> For those of you not old enough to get that Last Boy Scout reference, go watch that movie. It's phenomenal. It is a good movie. Um, I'm with you, Gooch. I love it. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say. It's gone too far in the sense that I'm with you, Brady. 
can draw that foul just by looking over his shoulder and saying, hey, he hit my shoulder pad. Um, uh, but I'm also going to put out, uh, hey, Andrew Luck, um, if you're done being retired, come back. The rules are a lot better now. You can actually have a career. And I'd love to see some better quarterback play, you know, in Indianapolis to at least make it interesting for Patrick. Um, have the rules really changed Gooch that much since uh, since he retired? Yeah, because wow. he was getting hit. He was getting hit so much in playing with the lacerated spleen and the cracked vertebrae and all of that. And he was just like standing back up and playing with it. He quit because he was getting hit so much, not drawing the penalties. He, he didn't want to be a crippled old man, you know, when he's he's a brilliant mind. Um, yeah, yeah. But on the flip side of that, on the flip side of that, I, I, think, I think it has to. I think it's gone too far. But unlike Keys, who says in six years when Brady retires, I think it's going to swing back sooner than that because you do have quarterbacks like Lamar, Mahomes, Burrow, who's a tough kid, um, Herbert, who's a tough kid, um, who who actually kind of like those hits because it gets them into the flow of the game. You know what I'm saying? And and they don't want – I mean, I've, I've listened to Mahomes take a hit and be like, hey, good hit. You know what I'm saying? But then he comes down and continues playing. I think those kids want those hits and not the flag and want you to let them let them guys play. You know what I'm saying? They're used to these guys hitting them. I mean, because the you don't have that same rough in the passer in college. I've seen quarterbacks get de cleated and and not get a call. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so he, these guys expect those hits. So most of them want them. You know, Lamar, like, he's quick to get up because for them, and I think it's going back to an old school thinking, they take that hit, they stand back up. It shows their team that they're, you know, their toughness and their willingness to go through the wars and the crowd gets behind them. So like, oh, our quarterback took that hit. Now we're about to, this is this is going to be live, right? Um, now we're going to kick your butts. Um <laughs> Heineke got thumped uh, pretty good this past weekend. Did you see that one? He had the ball yeah, up around his head, and, man, he got crushed. Well, if we're going to talk about anyone getting crushed, we should talk about that hit on Derek Carr. And that did not draw a flag because it was a clean hit. <laughs> and he popped I, right up. You know, give him credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah because he thing fumbled. Thing. Yep. Well, even then, even if he, even if he didn't, I really think he would have popped back up because he tried to play on that broken ankle. You don't take – that toughness doesn't dissipate. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't go away. Um, right. Rivers, for as much as I hate Phillip Rivers, the one thing you can never call that kid, you can never call him soft because um, he took plenty of hits and got back up. And, and I mean, it's, it's – um. Big Ben, until his arm went, Noodle Saw used to take hits like that. I mean, those guys, for every for every national treasure, idiot Tom Brady and person that likes Tom Brady, and uh, um, you've got your Aaron Rodgers, you know, or your Andrew Lux, or for every, I mean, heck, even Kyler Murray, I watched him get blasted on the sideline at five foot two, and he popped back up. I mean, I think is going to swing back even more. I think they're protecting old man because he made a comment. You know, I read it in an article, and I, this is I think he's close to the end, too. First, Belichick said he's not going to coach past 70, and he's 69. But Brady said that if he had won that one of the one of those Super Bowls that the Giants won, he wouldn't be playing right now. So I think he has – I think he sees the end for himself, too. And I don't think it's going to be six years. Well, I'll tell you, I don't believe Belichick, if he doesn't win the Super Bowl this year, I don't believe he retires at, at, until he wins one without Brady, just to prove that it's not Brady. <laughs> and, and I tend I tend to give Belichick more credit than, than Brady um, because I don't think going to a stacked Buccaneers team and winning the Super Bowl proves that it wasn't Belichick. Like, you're going to an all-star team 
And so, you know, explain to me how that proves that it was you and not the coach, because I'd still contend at least 10 or 15 quarterbacks in the NFL, if they were playing on last year's Buccaneers roster, uh, could have won the Super Bowl. Now, I think you can at least go to two thirds of the NFL's quarterbacks playing against the depleted Chiefs team in the Super Bowl, and they would have won. Maybe three fourths or four fifths of them, given, given, you know how much our offensive line was depleted in that game, and how much the Buccaneers' defense was really the one doing it, and how much the Buccaneers' offense was just running the ball all over us. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to get too far on that tangent, but you know, going back to the car hit, I think. Like, 100%, if that had been Brady, and that was still, you know, a clean legal hit on Carr, but if that had been Brady, he wouldn't have popped right up. He would have been on the ground, and he would have been crying, looking around, wanting a penalty, and basically been going, hey, I'm Tom Brady, you got to throw that flag. And so, I don't know. That's where I'm at on that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm Tom Brady. You got to throw that flag. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Don't. I mean, you know, I think that's what he says to these guys, right? Let's not disrespect the national treasure, the face of the league that is Tom Brady. Excuse me. Let me let uh, me go back and correct myself there. Tom Brady on, would have I looked got, at the ref. I got to find a said, trash can. Tom Brady would have went and looked at the ref and said, said, you got to throw, hey, I'm Tom Brady. You got to throw that flag, babe, or baby, whatever it was. <laughs> Rob Gronkowski was was saying that Tom Brady calls everybody babe or baby or something, right? You got to throw that flag, <laughs> honey. Baby. Come on, partner. You got to throw that flag for me. You know who I am? I'm Tom Brady. <laughs> I eat avocado ice cream and wear pajamas to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, right, well enjoyed that. there will be more Tom Brady jokes later on. <laughs> while, um, while we have the time, let's go ahead and let's skip to this. And now we understand that uh, we're recording Tuesday night. And uh, a couple things. One, uh, as we go into recording, you know, Adam Schefter has reported basically a thousand NFL players are are on the COVID list right now. Uh, and so maybe by the time Thursday night rolls around, it might be up to 12,000. We don't know. No, no, it's, it, it's like, it's still like 75 players in the last two days. So, you know, and we already know Jody or not Jody, sorry. We already know that Josh Gordon is on the list and Chris Jones is on the list now. And so, you know, we have no idea how that's going to affect the wide receiver room or defensive line room. Uh, you know, how many more chiefs could be added between Tuesday night and Thursday or even Friday, which brings us to number two, where we assume this is going to air on Friday, like it, like it normally does. But in case it airs Thursday, well, regardless, if it airs Friday, just know that what we say here in regards to, the Chargers game is going to be us giving our prediction and is going to give you a great opportunity to see how well we got it after the fact instead of before the fact. So understanding those two things, we will beat the Chargers if, or another way to phrase it, if this airs Friday, we beat the Chargers last night because, or, <laughs> we, didn't beat, or we didn't beat the Chargers last night because. <laughs> well, let me uh, start the answer with a question to you two studs. What uh, what do you guys think of the Chargers? Are are they similar to the 2018 Chiefs? I mean, do do they need to score 30 points to win these these Chargers? You know, this is this is such a it, it's such a crazy hang thing on, to wrap your hang head on, around. Keith, for for you for you go on your diatribe. Where are you going to diatribe? Hang on. Because mine can be short and sweet. Yes. <laughs> Except for the fact that 
Herbert can be fooled and Mahomes couldn't. Ah. Um, I think there's a way to trick Herbert or flush him, fluster him to where he makes some bad decisions. And But overall, they are built like the Chiefs. Now, I will get into the we will beat the Chargers if, but I know Keys wants to answer that 2018 Chiefs question, so I'm going to let him. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I was going to say is that, you know, I think when you look at, at – the parts on that team, I think this defense, their defense, this isn't exactly, you know, expected, right? Like I think going into the season, teams thought, you know, or or fans or everybody kind of thought that the Chargers were going to be like the Broncos, only much better on offense because they actually had their quarterback. And that, you know, Derwin James was healthy, Bosa is healthy, we, you know, we just thought that this team was going to be led by their defense and it was going to be only Herbert's progression on offense and the offense's ability that was going to hold this team back. And we didn't, you know, at least myself, didn't expect that it was going to be held back too much. Um, and so, you know, to, to kind of say that in 2018, I, I don't think I had the same expectations of the Chiefs defense. But I think there's one fundamental difference between the two teams, and that is because of the Chiefs' offense now, defenses are playing passing teams differently. And so I think because of the Chiefs over the last two or three years, it actually makes it harder for the Chargers' offense, whereas the Chiefs' offense had it easier because, and I know – you know, you said 2018, so we're back in the Alex Smith era. Um, but still, you know, over the last three years, it's made it harder for the Chargers offense to do what they're what they're planning to do for the whole season, right? We, we've already seen it start with the Chiefs offense and Mahomes, and we've already seen it now. It's trickled into – um, it's trickled into Josh Allen and the Bills passing offense. We've seen it tr- trickle – on to other passing offenses now. And, you know, so I think that makes it harder for the Chargers offense. And I don't know if that really fully answers your question, Jeff, but that's kind of where my mind is went. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, looking at the numbers, the yards per game, KC right now before the game on Thursday, 390 yards a game, Chargers 385, pretty even. Both teams average 27 points a game for the year. KC allows 20 and a half chargers allowed 26. And again, that's for the year. But if you focus on the last six to eight games, chiefs defense is about 18 points better a game than, than the chargers. They, uh, I took a look at like since week five, the chargers average allowing 29 points a game. (laughs) So, uh, you know, the turnover differential chargers are plus three for the season. We are plus zero. We're finally getting back up to even. And, uh, you know, in the two games where all our starters played against Herbert in his career, we are one and one so far. So it's hard to get a feel for, do we struggle against Herbert? Will we be able to handle him in this game? So here's my answer. Finally, we're going to beat the chargers if we are even or on the plus side for turnovers, you know, that first game this year, we were minus four and we lost by six points, you know, don't lose fumbles. Mahomes don't take a whole bunch of risks downfield. Second thing is we get pressure on Herbert and this will be hard to do if Chris Jones doesn't play. Right. So we're hoping in that. And then I don't know if, if Bosa plays for the Chargers, we, we got to find a way to get him blocked on pass plays and get the ball carrier past him on running plays. So that's my keys right there. As I look into my dark crystal ball right. that I got from the dark web as a master of the dark arts, as <laughs> Keys likes to call me, um, <laughs> We will win this game if Snead comes back. 
which Mike is possible. Stays on the COVID. Mike Williams stays on the COVID list. Okay. Um, who's the other receiver? Yeah, Alan. I know yeah, uh, Alan. Alan. The guy with the big mouth. Alan. Alan is that what you said? Keenan yeah. Allen. Is it Keenan? Yeah. Yeah, he needs to. Does he have COVID? I hope. So. I mean, I mean, I don't wish COVID on anybody. No. But uh, he needs to be in protocols. <laughs> Honestly, the Chiefs should. The Chiefs should win this game. Period. Uh, Mahomes has started showing that. He can be patient, even though he's notoriously said that's not his game. Yeah. I think he's understanding more and more that he'll get those 40-yard shots to Hardman and 30-yard shots to Pringle if he starts just taking the underneath for now. Because eventually yes. they'll have to come up. Yes. Um, as long as they continue to play the kind of ball that they've been playing and the defense stays the way I, – I honestly – I know we were we were we were otherworldly bad the first five weeks, and now we've been otherworldly good the last six, which means we're somewhere near the middle. Um, so as long as we can keep them within the ten to seventeen point range, I believe we win, and which is where I think we actually are. I mean, we've done average of 10 a game or less for the last four or five games um that's 85 bears worthy and let's let's face it as much as i love this team they're not the 85 bears no um but i still think like i still think 14 is right around a good number and even on our worst with everybody seeing the all the pundits everybody we're still averaging 20. so i mean Hold the Chargers down to 20 with that offense, we win the game. Because I think Patrick finds a way. I think I think they're coming into their own. Still a little hiccups, but they're starting to round it out or fight, figure it out. And as long as Spags can keep the D motivated, I think we win. I think I think the Chargers, it's funny. We always say the Raiders are gonna Raider. I think the Chargers are gonna do what they normally do, which is start out great and then just like the uh like the Bills here lately, just kind of slide and not realize what happened. Um, and I, I also predict we will beat the Chargers if I'm going to say we are in first place by the end of the game, sole possession of first place because New England has the bye this week. And if we've already beaten them, we are in first place, the number one seed. Way to go, Chiefs, if y'all don't see this till Friday. <laughs> Keys, Keys, what what needs to happen if we're gonna beat the Chargers? Oh, 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 oh yeah, oh yeah. We need to pour some stickum on the receivers' hands for this game. <clears throat> on on our That's receivers' all. hands? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, here go the HGs. The horse grants are all coming right. on. So, as Jeff pointed out, in the last game, we had four turnovers and we lost by six. Yes, sir. In that game, we did not have Willie Gay. We did not have Ward. We did not have, I want to say, Frank Clark, or he wasn't healthy. And we didn't have Melvin Ingram even on the team at that point. Right. Right. We essentially well, lost by Jones. we essentially lost by six because of four turnovers. We had no pass rush. Our defense was utterly in shambles. Now I think our offense hadn't quite derailed at that point yet, uh, other than the four turnovers. You know they they were still able to score points, and so you know. We still haven't seen them score points like the way that they had before this season or even the way they had at the beginning of this season and the way they have against the Raiders twice against any other team since then, since like week four or five, who's not named the Raiders. So, you know, we need to see that again uh, against the Chargers defense. Um 
but you know, I think that I think these things mean that it should be an easier time this time. I mean, four turnovers is crazy, and they only lose by six. Yeah. With an absolutely terrible defense, with no pat, with no pass rush, we didn't even have a run defense at that time. And Gooch, I'm actually going to disagree with you on this one, and I'm actually going to agree with the Honey Badger on this. Like, I think this defense can continue to get better, and we know it can continue to get better because we all know one of the obvious ways for it to continue to get better is for Spags to once again decrease Sorensen and Neiman snaps and start putting other players in in place of them. And those two moves, again, will make the defense continue to get even better. Hey, Keys, guess what? I'm looking at the snap counts for that game. Sorensen had 60 out of 63 snaps that game. <laughs> right. Now, to be fair to him, you know, he yeah. still has. That's just because that, that, that Derek Carr just doesn't have the vision because everybody else finds where 49 is and starts chucking the ball that way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Derek Carr did the first game, right? No, I mean, all right, so it's still a division game, and Sorensen is still going to get his one big play. Yeah, there you go. Like, I mean, he has every divisional game this year. As much as Gooch has laughed it off, he'll still get his one big play. But still, <laughs> 60 out of 63 snaps. I mean, yeah. and he's been up around, he's been back up to around 50% again the last few weeks or so. Okay. And again, you know, maybe some of that is you're trying to give some players some rest. But, you know, again, I don't want to get back into that. But you can go ahead and, you know, put DOD and Watts in those situations instead of Neiman and Sorensen. Anyway, uh, so all that said, you know, I mean, it, it almost seems like a no-brainer, which, you know, always kind of scares me sometimes when it, when it seems like such a no-brainer. Sure. Um, but I mean, six turn or four turnovers, you lose by six, and your defense is completely horrible at that point. And I do agree with with the Honey Badger that I think that the defense can continue to improve more and more. I don't think Ingram and the defensive line have all completely gelled yet, and I think they can each gel better, even more, and take it up a notch. Um, you know, I think that Spags can finally find the right mix with his linebackers. We saw Mike Hughes with those two fumbles in the last game. Hughes hasn't been on the field defensively, really. And, you know, Spags talked about um, Merritt and Madison, you know, seeing constant improvement out of Hughes. I think sometimes as fans, we look at who players were at the beginning of the season or, you know, maybe even the last time we saw them in action. And in our minds, we don't think that they can actually improve game to game or even from the beginning of a season to the end of the season. Uh, but they can. And especially guys who are new to the system, uh, who are new to the team. So I would be interested in seeing how what – what Hughes can do moving forward and how he can be integrated into the defense and what extra flexibility that affords the defense. You know, you see Snead come back and I'm expecting he'll be back since he's already flown back. Um, you know, I don't see why he would fly back and then not play Thursday basically. So I think he'll be back for it. That only helps the defense. You know, as you said, though, you know, if Jones doesn't play, and right now we have no idea. We we just found out today that he was on the on the COVID list, reserve list, or whatever it's called. Um, but the counter to that is Rashawn Slater, the Charger stud left tackle, is also on that list, and so I think that really helps kind of counterbalance that. So if Jones can't go and Slater can't go. You know, you put Ingram there. Frank is healthy. You still have Reed. Uh, those three guys and Naughty and some of the other defensive linemen have still flashed, you know, here and there. Um, you know, again, and our run defense has looked a lot better moving forward. So I think that our defense 
is going to frustrate the Chargers offense a lot more than they did the first game. And for me, it's just a question of what version of our offense shows up. So I know it's not fair to them to continually say week after week they have to prove it. But I think coming out of the bye, I said, I got to see them the next two games, right? Because the Raiders game almost doesn't count because we've now seen <clears throat> two Raiders games where it doesn't look like the defensive coordinator for the Raiders is competent. Um, and so we got to see how they do against the Chargers offensively. Are they going to look like they have against the Raiders? Or are they going to look something closer to what we you know, saw out of them? many of the previous weeks beforehand. And so I, I think that's the big, again, it's the big thing for me. Um, you know, if they come out, the receivers are catching passes like they did in the Raiders game. You know, uh, we're, Andy's calling plays and Patrick is handing the ball off on the RPOs. Jeff said it, it was fairly balanced. Right, Jeff, you said it was fairly balanced in the Raiders game. Yeah, we ran the ball more than we threw, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure a good chunk of those were were called RPOs that Patrick actually hand, handed the ball off. And so, yeah, that's right. Holy you know, cow. I mean, I mean, that's growth on his part. And so if we continue to see that growth on his part in this game, you know, it's basically, to me, it's going to come down to whoever's calling the plays offensively. Uh, Patrick's decision making and the receivers catching the ball and you know outside of that um, I mean I think that's really it you know unless we between now and then there's some more players who who aren't going to play because of you know the, the COVID protocol I'm going to start a war in the comments real quick because I'm going to pick a war with the two of you real quick um, we, why is it that for the Kansas City Chiefs, it is not okay to win 17-10? And everybody wants to see more from the offense, more from the offense. Ooh. Whereas if we were, if we were any other franchise, 17 10 we'd be like oh man we gotta win yes we we just won a super bowl but if we're not winning 30 it's it's funny nick wright kind of said the same thing if we're not winning 37 32 yes we didn't score enough points that's right i, I just i i just don't understand i have an answer why 22 to 9 is a terrible game yeah the like, offense is ahead, broken Jeff, i'll let you have it the yeah. offense is broken when we win 19 to 9 and 22 to 9 or whatever. It, right. To me, it, it's it's all about expectations. The media has expectations in their brain. And if you don't meet those expectations, there's something wrong with you. Well, wait, we scored more points than they did. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The Chiefs were so exciting and interesting to watch. And they were winning 42 to 30 and doing all this stuff. And now they're winning you know, by scoring less than 20, oh my gosh, Patrick Mahomes, is he ever going to get back to his normal form? Well, he's fourth in the league in pass yards. What do you guys want? What What do you need to see? Well, he's thrown 12, 12 interceptions. Well, we're nine and four. You know, uh, Herbert's thrown 11 interceptions and they're seven and six. Oh, well, uh, so it, it's just, to me, it's all about expectations. The media thinks that you should play a certain way the you know based on what you said gooch the patriots win 19 to 9 and it's bill belichick's a genius and he's leading this uh you know, rookie quarterback and oh my gosh they're just amazing well nobody expected them to be you know where they are leading their division right so that that's my answer what, what do you think steve if you're asking are you asking Gooch, are you asking from like a national perspective or are you asking from like a fan perspective based on what I've said? I, I'm, I'm actually asking kind of as both. You know what I'm saying? Because the media says the Chiefs offense is broken, like Jeff said, but we're winning. But then there are plenty of people like we need to see more from the offense. But once again, we're winning. And <laughs> when we were winning, 
42 to 30, the complaint was, oh, the defense is horrible. Look at how Mahomes has to be otherworldly and superhuman for us to win. And now the defense is right now the number one ranked scoring defense in the NFL. And it's, oh, Mahomes and the offense is broken. They can only score 19 points and beat a team 19-9, or they only beat Jordan Love by seven points. And I don't give a crap what you think about Jordan Love. You know what he is? An NFL quarterback. <laughs> and there are, there are only so many of those in the world. You know what I'm saying? So yes, sir. I mean, it's, it's it, to me, first of all, it's disrespectful of the two to say, oh, you only beat this team because of this guy, because that guy is getting paid millions of dollars, which 99% of the world's population cannot do for doing something that they cannot do. And then um, then it was like, oh, you only beat the Cowboys because they had lost Amari Cooper and C.D. Lamb after a half. You know what? They have other receivers. You know what I'm saying? Just as quick as people are like, uh, the national pundits, oh, the Chiefs are so great because Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill and all the weapons. But if you take those weapons away, you know what? Then we still have weapons because we pay Pringle and we pay Hardman and we pay, at the time, Sammy Watkins. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's this, y'all act like, like, it's almost like it's, it's, it's a shame or it should be shameful that the Chiefs are winning by 10 when all the last two years, y'all begged for the Chiefs to have a defense. Now we've got one. And so the offense doesn't have to score 40 points. There you go. You know what I'm saying? Patrick himself, I've been pressing because he's wanting to put up all those points. You don't have to. Complimentary football is just that. Offense doing just enough to win. Defense doing just enough to win. Special teams for field position. It's always been the game. And by the so way, I, I just the other person. I fact checked right. myself. Mahomes is fifth in pass yards. Herbert is fourth. So yeah, I just wanted to clear that up. But yeah, I don't think Mahomes is broken when he's thrown for thirty six hundred yards. Yeah, you know, they were like, Oh, against the Raiders, Mahomes' passing rating is one thirty, but against everybody else it's eighty eight. The average is ninety guys, and he's been winning throwing 10 of 19 for 194 yards. <laughs> you, you know, if, if Alex Smith had that game, they'd be saying, hell of a game, Alex. We won, baby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Mahomes is in, it's like, what's wrong with your brain? Anyway, yeah. go ahead, Keys. I'm sorry. I, I yeah. was ranting. Go ahead. I'll try to answer, I'll try to answer this for, for both sides of this. Um, and I'll start with the fan side first. And, you know, I think part of it's something that we've kind of talked about before is, you know, when I, I think when fans are being critical, part of it is, you know, we want a team that we're, that we're confident can make it to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl, you know, from, from one side of things. So we see it's clear the offense, you know, no matter what the stats say, the scoreboard doesn't reflect that the offense is playing up to its potential, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's it's kind of like if, if our defense were leading all these statistical categories like yards, you know, sacks, interceptions, forced fumbles, and all these things, but we were giving up like 27 points a game, right? You wouldn't say, well, that's a great defense. Well, some people might, but a lot, you know, there would be a huge argument and say, well, ultimately it comes down to they're not stopping teams from scoring. So I think, you know, some of that, some of that comes into play. We've talked before how, you know, as Chiefs fans, we had great defenses in the 90s. You know, we had great offense with Vermeil. You know, we've had great offenses with Andy Reid. I think there's some desire to see both at the same time that comes into play. And I think for younger fans, I think if we're just being honest, it's, it's a Madden mentality. When you play Madden, you play offense to score as many points as you can. And you play defense to, you know, to get as many sacks and interceptions and stuff and to allow the least 
you want the biggest margin, you know, a victory as possible every time you play a Madden game. And so I think that seeps over, you know, for younger fans as they're fans of an actual team. From a national perspective, outside of, you know, the whole clickbaity part of it, you know, I think some of it comes down to if you look at this team and you look at, you know, 2019 team, um, Patrick Mahomes is essentially a rookie, even though technically, you know, he's a second year player. And that is the you know, huddle mascot, by the way. Oh, nice. And he throws for 50 touchdowns and 5,000 yards, you know, his first right. season as a starter. Yeah. If you look at that offense and you, no matter how fair it is or not, Gooch, if you look at that offense and you compare it to this offense, you know, essentially you have two negative changes, and that's we don't have Sammy Watkins on this team anymore, and we don't have Kareem Hunt. Um, you know, you can uh, even look – you can even throw – don't say it. You can't say it public. Um, you could even throw Mitch Schwartz in there as well, right? You could, you could even throw Mitch Schwartz in there as well and say those three players, you know, have made a big difference um, on there. And so – but if you go to today – you know, basically the receiver room, you've lost Sammy Watkins, but you otherwise have basically the same weapons who are now older, who should be talented. You've added Hardman since then, you know, who should be able to do something with his speed. You know, Travis is just as wise. He's a little bit older, but he's just as wise. Um, you know, you've replaced Damian Williams with, CEH and everybody else can fight about their opinion, you know, about that one uh, all day long. But the one big thing that we've done is Patrick Mahomes has multiple years of experience since then. And we have a new interior offensive line who, that might be the best overall interior offensive line in the NFL. And that's something we were missing when we were running out Andrew Wiley and Austin Ryder and whoever else you want to throw out there, no disrespect for um, uh, Kalechi Assembly and, you know, Stefan Wisniewski, you know, and some of those guys, uh, Allegretti, um, Rimmers, you know, no offense to, to, to some of these guys that have been on the offensive line the last two or three years or the or last year's Super Bowl. But we probably have one of the best interior offensive lines, if not the best in the NFL. Creed Humphrey is the best center in the NFL. You know, Joe Tooney is probably the best left guard or one of the top two or three left guards in the NFL. And Trey Smith is right up there for a rookie. And so when you look at it in what may seem kind of like a logical way, it can – it's pretty understandable why expectations on the offense would be bigger and people might discount how NFL defenses are continuing to adapt and to attack the chiefs offense. And, you know, it's kind of a strain between how much do these different improvements outweigh losses and outweigh what other defenses have done because you know, Patrick has been in the league now. This is, what, his third year as a starter? Mm. Right? His, his fourth year overall? 18, 19, 20, 21. Yeah, four, fourth year as a starter. Well, he didn't start in 18. Yeah, he did. Was it 18? Yeah. So he was drafted in seven, 2017? Okay. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> thanks, Jeff, for making, right? a bit, for making I think this so. case stronger. Yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, because 19 was the Super Bowl. That would have been the second year. 2020 was the loss, and now we're here in 21. Yeah. There you go. He's a veteran. <laughs> He's an old man now. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that, you know, that just makes – that would just make their case even stronger. Fourth year as a starter, fifth in the NFL. You're expecting to see 
a much more dynamic, a, a, a much better dissector of the defenses, fair or not, in Patrick Mahomes in his fourth year as a starter compared to his first year. And so sometimes you can think, okay, well, the statistics should match that, you know. And so losing Sammy but gaining some other players and an overall improvement on the interior offensive line, you know, can lead people to expect the offense to look a heck of a lot better than it has. And I'll count myself in there to an extent. Um, You know, overall, though, a win is a win. But again, you know, I do think as fans, we should, you know, partially have an eye towards what it's going to take to, to play, to make it to and to win a Super Bowl. And so for me right now, again, I got to see more out of the offense against the team that's not the Raiders. And that's not disrespect for the Chiefs defense or the Chiefs offense, but we're going to play some teams that aren't the Raiders. And we're going to have to see some complete wins that kind of look somewhat similar to the Raiders game. And if we're honest, you know, some of us, our hearts need those games so that we don't have a heart attack. And for all of us, I think it's a lot more enjoyable for us to see those kinds of games. Um, And I think it's harder for us seeing the 2018 Chiefs offense and seeing this defense, and for us to not to say, you know, what would it be like to see both of those at the same time on the same team happening in the same season? Well, I should probably say something here, but um, I completely agree. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm with you, Keys. I just, I have my thoughts on it. It was a good use of the HGs this week, brother. Um, <laughs> and let's just on win. Home. Let's just adopt the, since since the Raiders are our sons, I don't know if anybody's seen uh, yeah. Derek Carr's yeah. <laughs> it could be a page. We're going to just adopt the phrase, we're just going to win, baby. Let's just win. <laughs> anyway. Big shout out to Jeff for joining us for the second time. We're gonna have to do this again. Um, Would love to, always, guys. We appreciate. Yep, appreciate it's good to be with you. This, uh... <laughs> we appreciate anybody that watches this content, whether religiously or in passing. Go back, check out the other RGR stuff. Become a member. Join us on Discord. Catch the live stream on Mondays and Thursdays. Dan's game film on whatever days those are. Um, make sure you tell somebody you love them. Serious about that ending part, and uh, we'll catch you in the next one. All right, peace out, guys. This is the Rogue Head Ruddle. Wow, welcome to the Ruddle. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't put it up here. I knew it. It got in my head. I said, if I don't put it up here so I can read it, I'm going to mess this up. <laughs> Thanks for watching this video from the team at RGR Football. Click these videos to see more and subscribe to RGR Football.